welcome into the Informed Secular Minds podcast, episode five. Episode five already. Is, we are cooking. Which uh, which one of like the are we are we Empire at this point? Is this Empire Strikes Back? Yeah, we are. This is episode five. It's, You're right. The best one. This is going to be the best one. Then we are going to uh, welcome in. By the way, our, our special guest here. Uh, if you would like to call in and speak to us, we are the Informed Secular Minds. Please feel free to do so. Six four six five six four nine five five one. You can also chat with us in the chat room, uh, and of course, make sure you follow us on Twitter at ISM Podcast underscore. He is at Dopinephrine. I am at Atheist Husker. I'm going to bring in a uh, special guest, is, uh, Danielle Constein, uh, who oversees operations at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center, which is located between Cody and Powell, Wyoming, uh, which is the home of the former uh, concentration camp, which housed 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II, and of course you can go and you can see, I believe it's heartmountain.org. Is that the name of the website? Yeah, heartmountain.org is uh, where you can get more information on their efforts there, uh, along with the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, uh, where uh, Danielle Constein works. We're honored to have her with us uh, this evening. Uh, it was a, a real pleasure uh, that she agreed to, uh, to do the show. Yeah, Danielle, uh, welcome on. Uh, tell us a little bit about... What you do there at the uh, at, at Heart Mountain, and then give us a, a little bit of a of a brief history, if you don't mind. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I do want to clarify just really quick. Uh, Heart Mountain was one of ten sites, so we only housed about fourteen thousand Japanese Americans here at Heart Mountain. Um, I'm the operations manager here for the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. We run a museum um, and a historical site on. Uh, the actual location where one of 10 concentration camps during World War II uh, was located to house Japanese Americans or persons of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast um, following the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, We do all sorts of things. We host events. Uh, We have a full museum. Um, We host events all over the country. We do a lot to preserve and to memorialize the stories of the just over 14,000 individuals who were incarcerated here over the course of the three years between 1941, I'm sorry, 1942 and 1945 that Heart Mountain was in operation. Uh, Danielle, what are some of the, some of like the biggest reasons that you think that um, people may not have, because it, in, in Corey, obviously you guys living in, 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 you live in Wyoming as well. So, and by the way, if you would like, if you go to uh, ISM podcast on Periscope, Corey did a video right there on location yesterday. Feel free to go and watch that. It is uh, quite amazing. Uh, Danielle, why do you think this is kind of not necessarily trying to be erased? from American history, uh, but kind of not mentioned as as much? I think there are a lot of factors to that. Uh, For a long time, um, it wasn't something that we as a country wanted to talk about. Uh, It was also a regional issue. So at the time, these were only people who lived west of the Rocky Mountains, so just our west coast, and they were uh, incarcerated in 10 sites across the western United States. So the further east you go, I think the less people were aware of it at the time. Um, And then as time passed and we realized these concentration camps started in the identical way that um, Hitler had started his camps in Europe, and they took very different paths, but the connotation of concentration camp in World War II became so synonymous with the death camps or the extermination camps in Europe uh, that we really kind of went on a, a campaign as a country to erase that as part of our history, or at least to push it to the back burner, I think, uh, America tends to see itself as the good guy, and this did not support that narrative. Over time, I think as we saw um, 
prejudice against Japanese Americans continue following the war. Uh, and so many people had returned uh, from the Pacific theater with this idea that Japanese Americans and Japanese nationals, maybe they aren't so different. And being able to see that difference and to recognize that these were American citizens, um, I think that took a long time for us to reach a point where we were able to have this discussion in a calm manner, leaving out uh, a lot of the racism that had gone along with it for so long. So this was this was in response to the attack on uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, Imperial Japan attacked the United States, uh, and we talked about this a couple of episodes back, uh, of course, on uh, on the anniversary there, December seventh. Um, but this, th- these these hundred twenty thousand people, these weren't uh, prisoners of war. These weren't uh, Imperial Japanese. Uh, can you tell us? Uh, you, can, can you tell us? Uh, who these people were? Were were these um, were these all immigrants? No, uh, of the hundred and twenty thousand, roughly seventy thousand or two thirds of them were American citizens. So at this time, the Chinese Exclusion Act um, was in effect, which meant unless you were of Western European descent, if you were born anywhere in the world outside of America, you could not become a U.S. citizen. So anyone who's a black African or who was of Asian descent, they couldn't be U.S. citizens. So when they immigrated here to start a life in America, they knew that they were alien residents for the duration of their lifetime. If they brought along a child who was eight months old who was born in Japan, that child could not, for the duration of their lifetime, be a U.S. citizen. But when they had kids, um, because it's in our Constitution, those children were naturalized citizens that were born here. So all of the property that they owned um, were, was in the name of these children who were born here. And those 70,000 American citizens, most of them didn't speak Japanese. They couldn't read Japanese. They had never been to Japan. Uh, they were educated in the public school system here. Uh, and they had actually worked really hard to Americanize um, actually more so uh, to assimilate than most um, most other cultures at this time had. And so if you look at various immigrant groups, you see less assimilation uh, than you'd seen among Japanese Americans. So these were people that were uh, uh, made up as a majority uh, of American citizens um, who were stripped of due process, uh, who lost uh, many of their constitutional rights and were incarcerated for years, um, separated from their property, moved to the interior of the United States uh, where they didn't necessarily know people, um, where they where they couldn't uh, engage in, in the crafts that they had learned uh, on the West Coast. They couldn't uh, uh, easily till the land. Many of these people, I understand, were farmers in California uh, and some of the uh, the other West Coast states. Um, this this is this is an example of of fear i think causing a great deal of overreach casting a wide net in order to uh in order to make people feel safer um they decided to just get everybody who looked like they were japanese um and put them in camps in the hopes that that would stop any any assumed future attack which of course never came um did did this do anything to protect the United States uh, of these 120,000 people um, that were that were incarcerated? How many of them turned out to be uh, secret agents or or working for Imperial Japan or trying to undermine the war effort in the United States? There actually uh, never was a case of a confirmed um, spy who is of Japanese ancestry in the United States. So absolutely zero espionage. Um, I think it's important to note that, well, for the general public, Pearl Harbor was the catalyst, and there was this war hysteria uh, that really increased the fear. The anti-Japanese movement on the West Coast uh, had been going strong for quite some time. Actually, pre-1900, there had been anti-Asian um, groups advocating on the West Coast, and particularly against the Japanese. 
We had a we had a comment from Periscope. Um, Atheist advisor said, although I think it's wrong for what happened to the Japanese, I can't really show or justify that. Um, can you expand at all on on what what makes this wrong? Why you know we all kind of feel like it's wrong. We all we all can empathize enough to to know that. Um, had we been Japanese, we wouldn't want to be pulled out of our homes and lose our property and be moved to uh, an alien place that we that we weren't familiar with and kept behind barbed wire and uh, uh, guarded by men with guns. Um, we can we can feel that way. Um, what makes this actually wrong? It was an unconstitutional act. Um, if you look at our constitution, you're guaranteed due process, and no one who was incarcerated uh, of these 120,000 actually stood trial. There was no conviction, there was no jury of their peers, they were simply told uh, that they were being incarcerated. Um, if you read the actual statements that went up across the West Coast, they say to all persons of Japanese ancestry, alien or non-alien residents. So we took people who were born in America, who have called themselves American citizens, to whom we called American citizens their whole lives up until this moment when suddenly they're non-alien residents. That's crazy. That's, that goes against everything that we um, purport to stand for as a country. Constitution um, talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, I, 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 I'm not a lawyer, but I don't know how you could make a case that when you are restricted to a cold slice of desert in the middle of Wyoming, uh, you are equally free to pursue happiness as the next citizen. Well, and we can go through, I mean, you could go through the entire Bill of Rights and almost every single one uh, was violated. Uh, there were illegal searches uh, and seizures of property by the U.S. government leading up to incarceration. Um, there were specific religions that were outlawed in camp. Uh, there were, um, sorry, going to my notes here, uh, I already talked about habeas corpus. Um, there's just really so many issues here that stem from what we consider to be our core values as a country and what our laws are. Now, I understand that uh, later on as the, as the war effort continued uh, in Europe, that eventually um, Uncle Sam approached the uh, the Japanese Americans that were uh, incarcerated in these camps, and uh, asked them, uh, or rather told them that they were being drafted to go serve their country overseas. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? So the draft was instated. Um, originally, all Japanese Americans had been classified as 4C, which meant that they were uh, ethnically or morally unfit to serve in the U.S. military. Um, after our war efforts had gone on for a while, they actually reinstated the draft in the camps. And this followed um, a fairly confusing loyalty questionnaire that uh, led to a lot of people um, being forced to repatriate to Japan or patriate to Japan for those who had never been there before. And many men served. So I think many people have heard of the... Uh, 442 or the 442nd Regimental Combat Unit, um, the Gopher Broke Unit. They are the single most decorated unit in American history for their size and duration of service. They were a segregated Japanese American unit made up of um, people from Hawaii who were not incarcerated and from uh, anything east of the Rockies. And then all of those who were in the camps who had been drafted into the military. Um, but Despite the sort of stereotype of Japanese Americans just simply submitting and going along and being almost docile, uh, there were a significant number of men who chose to resist the draft, uh, particularly here at Heart Mountain. We had 63 men who were tried in the largest mass trial in Wyoming's history and sentenced to three years in federal penitentiaries for draft evasion. 
<laughs> wow. And again, this, uh, again, it's the Informed Secular Minds podcast. We are joined this evening uh, by Danielle Constein, who is overseas operations at Heart Mountain Interpretive Center up there between Cody and Powell, Wyoming. If you'd like to call in and ask her any questions about uh, basically more than anything else, Japanese internment or concentration camps, feel free to do so. 646-564-9551. I would like to say I did, I did notice because we spoke about uh, this, this fella a little bit earlier. Uh, on, uh, on, we talked about having a conversation on the Twitters with him. Uh, the one Zane, Lex Zane. I think I'm going to go with Alex because I see Alex there in the, in the chat room. Uh, I said I, I sent him a tweet while you guys were kind of chatting there, and I said, "Hey, I, I see you in the chatty room. Why don't you why don't you give us a call?" And he uh, he let us know that our show sucks enough the way it is. So thank you for that. Um, and then uh, he he went on to say, "You know, liberal Democrats locked up the Japanese." Um, response to that. Yeah, I mean, FDR was extremely liberal. He was a Democrat. Uh, he was also very racist, particularly against people of Asian descent. Um, when he was speaking about Japanese Americans, uh, he said that interbreeding with the Asian races is what he would term the yellow plague. It would be the downfall of the white race. He, uh, as many people at that time who were well-educated, believed in what we now term scientific racism or social Darwinism. Uh, No issue falls perfectly along modern political lines if you're looking at a previous time period. Um, It's a very complicated issue, and his personal prejudice overruled what we might believe uh, him to espouse today if he were president now. Yeah, absolutely, and I can certainly see that. I don't, I don't know that a lot of people um, even really know that about uh, about you know FDR. A lot of people kind of see him as you know kind of like the uh, you know the American hero. But Corey and I have also mm-hmm. uh, we've had multiple conversations about um, about FDR, and because you know we're both you know in, into the history as well, and I don't think that that people really quite you know, quite grasp that. And of course, we are going to get into uh, some of the, the, because this is, of course, the informed secular minds, we're going to get into some of the secular and religious aspects of that. Um, and, and, but there was a, a question as well, uh, and it said, what was the economic impact? Were the internees able to recover their property after their release? And if not, who kept their property? It's a great question. Um, so most incarcerees were given about 48 to 72 hours to gather what they could carry and go to um, an assembly center before they were sent to these final camps. And in that time, uh, there were looters, there were vandals, there were people um, who would come in and they were bargain hunters. And so for your entire home, I'll give you you know, $5 or whatever it is. And nobody knew what was going to happen, so a lot of Japanese Americans um, did sell their items or they hid them or buried them or um, there are stories of women who smashed their their china um, rather than sell it at such a small price. So there were a lot of things that were lost. Their accounts, their bank accounts were frozen. And so if you had a mortgage or a lien or anything on your home, Uh, that would have been gone. Squatters' rights are also a real thing. So after a few years of non-payment or of somebody just living in your home, uh, those things could be taken from you. So there were a lot of white people, particularly, uh, who benefited from this incarceration. Uh, There are a lot of arguments to be made um, that that is one of the top reasons for incarceration of Japanese Americans in World War II. Uh, There was a small amount of redress, which is a little different legally than reparations, paid to them in the 1990s. You had to prove that you were incarcerated. It couldn't be your parents or your grandparents. It had to be you directly. And each individual who's still alive at that time 
some 50, 60 years later, uh, was able to get $20,000. Now, the property that Japanese Americans lost in the 40s is the equivalent to um, over $2 billion worth of property today. Wow. Goodness gracious. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know that, Corey. I don't know if, if you knew that. Um, it's a staggering figure. So, uh, and again, this is a, uh, I was going to ask about, uh, about George, uh, George Takai. I know I, I'll wait to ask about that. <laughs> uh, cause I, I know you have comments on that. Um, how did religion affect the, um, attitudes of, Calling you know, I would say that most most people in the country then, as well as now, were probably Christian um, believers toward that people that knew said that they were religious and they actually knew about it. How did it affect their attitude toward that? And what about the subsequent, you know, the, the conflict over the draft as it as it comes toward, uh, you know, Christianity and in America and things like that? So. It- this is actually a, a really large issue. Um, so just kind of starting with the lead up to incarceration and how religion played a part in that. Um, I think people are a mixed bag. You're going to have good or bad in, in any situation. In the case of religion, um, it actually played a really strong role in the racism against Japanese Americans. So in Japan, there are a few different uh, religions, but Shinto uh, is the sort of accepted um, really ancient religion that is pr- practiced in Japan uh, and involves a level of animism and ancestor worship. Um, but beginning in about 1868 uh, through about 1912, there was this new element added to it. Um, and it was that there was emperor worship where Basically, the emperor is an embodiment of God. So if you look at uh, like pharaohs or uh, kind of old European kings and queens who are said to have their uh, thoughts basically handed to them by a divine power, this is something that was cropping up uh, around the same time that Americans were beginning to really have some... Uh, interactions with Japan a little heavier, and we were starting to get uh, more immigrants from Japan. And this played a really strong role. This idea that their religion involved emperor worship uh, led people to have a lot of um, misconceptions uh, about what that meant, as well as what that would mean for Japanese Americans. So the belief that every single person in America was worshiping uh, the emperor of Japan and would be willing to die for him, to sacrifice themselves and their loved ones uh, in worship for this man uh, or man God. And this miscommunication, this idea that this religion, we just didn't understand it, uh, really led to a lot of the prejudice against Japanese Americans. And you see it um, at Buddhist temples up and down the West Coast that were vandalized. You see uh, all sorts of picketing. Uh, there was actually a man, uh, Senator Phelan from California, who ran with the slogan, Keep California White. And he would hold demonstrations in front of Japanese American churches and community centers. And so you really start to see how religion starts to play a part in this um, and really separate them. There's also a connection. Most of the people who had been to Japan and really uh, from America and came back were missionaries. And so their interactions with Japanese people in Japan uh, are very framed in a specific way, and it deals with their religion. So we do see uh, kind of, I'll I'll term it fascinating, there's this shift uh, between the generations. So Issei are first-generation Japanese Americans, uh, practice Shinto or Zen or Buddhism, Um, but they send their children to Sunday schools. They send their children to Christian churches because they want them to be Americanized. And so this recognition that 
their religion plays a role in how their race is viewed and how they're viewed politically um, is really something that I think maybe hasn't been recognized or explored fully uh, until fairly recently when we're looking at history. When the when the draft went into effect, um, you were talking about how there was there was a, a group of men at the Heart Mountain uh, camp who resisted the draft. Um, how was how was that seen by the rest of America? What were the attitudes uh, towards draft draft resistance for these people who had already been stripped of some of their constitutional rights? And uh, can you tell us anything about how? Um, religion uh, impacted those views? So the draft resistors at Heart Mountain were organized uh, into what they termed the Fair Play Committee. And as I said, 63 of them stood trial and were convicted for draft evasion. And they served three years, uh, actually passed their sentences, went beyond the end of the camp, beyond the end of the war that they were imprisoned. And the religion actually plays a, a, an interesting role in this as well. So across the country, um, Quakers were really against the war in general. They were specifically against Japanese-American incarceration. And they did a lot to get families out of the camps, to relocate them, uh, to help them start over, begin new lives, go to schools that are run by Quakers. Uh, they did a great deal. And they also uh, had connections to the Nation of Islam uh, for just kind of refreshing everyone's brain here, um, Malcolm X eventually became um, one of the figureheads for Nation of Islam. Oh, behind the brass stand up. <laughs> in, Sorry. you're good. Uh, in World War II, they were also practicing um, civil disobedience, and they were... Um, conscientious objectors, just like the Quakers who chose not to serve in the war. So we have the Quakers who are connected to the Nation of Islam, who are Muslim, and they're helping, um, in some cases, uh, people to evade the draft. And in certain communes are actually helping people, uh, African-American men who are choosing to resist the draft, they're sneaking them across the border into Canada to help them evade. And the Nation of Islam, when they came out with statements about why they were choosing to resist, they said that support of Japanese Americans who were resisting, support of those who were incarcerated uh, without due process, were some of the top reasons why they were choosing to make this statement to object. Um, so you see some religious groups really coming around the draft uh, resistors and helping their causes, and uh, along with the wider Japanese American community. And again, this is uh, we're joined this evening by Danielle Constein. She oversees operations at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center there between Cody and Powell, Wyoming, which housed uh, about fourteen thousand. Uh, Japanese Americans in what we would consider uh, we call it internment camps. We would actually call them today concentration camps. And and I do want to ask about that. You know, when we use the word concentration camp, the first thing that we think of is you know the, the German uh, the German form of that. So you think of like Auschwitz and places like that, which were actually death camps. What was it like? And, and of course, again, George Takei, George Takei, I, I say his name wrong, I know. What, w what was it like living in, in a place in a place like this? And, and were they still able to, uh, to, to worship as they, as, as they wanted to freely? Uh, life was difficult. They put them in very remote locations on purpose, usually in places where they needed labor for agricultural reasons. Um, and you had very little, and these were very hastily built camps. Here at Heart Mountain, um, the camp was built in just under uh, three months, 
Each 120-foot-long barrack building that would have housed approximately 80 people uh, took just under an hour to build. So 56 to 58 minutes to build a house for about 80 people. And if we're looking at square footage, if you strip down a uh, four-bedroom home with a two-car garage and you fill that with 80 people, those are kind of the, the living conditions that we're looking at. And they were rough hewn wood. Uh, the trees would have been cut down the same day that the uh, buildings were actually built. They were covered with tar paper. Uh, and if you've ever been to Wyoming uh, and experienced the wind here, tar paper didn't hold up so well. And there were huge gaps and the dust storms and the wind and the snow, it made for very rough conditions. And we're looking at not just Hart Mountain here in Wyoming, but Manzanar in Southern California, Tule Lake in Northern California. You have two uh, in Arizona out in the desert on an Indian reservation. Uh, There are two in what I have heard people refer to as swampy farmland uh, down in Arkansas. So they're spread out all over the Western United States in really terrible conditions um, that are particularly difficult for the elderly and the really young. Um, They did have some level of religious freedom. However, camp administrators really pushed to have Christianity become the norm. And so we see that Shinto Buddhism, or I'm sorry, Shinto is actually outlawed and it's often combined with a form of Buddhism. Uh, Shinto was completely against the rules. You could not practice this. And that was tied to, uh, as I said, the emperor worship uh, along with some ancestor worship there. Uh, Zen, uh, which is similar to Buddhism, but enough different. uh, It doesn't involve reincarnation usually. It just deals with meditation. Uh, was actually severely restricted. Uh, Same with Buddhism. It was restricted. You weren't allowed to have things that were considered traditionally Japanese, um, really practiced in large groups for a long time in the camp. So the right to gather and to practice and to worship, those were not things that anyone had truly freely except for the Christians. Oh wow, that's um. They'd, so, in in reality, they because they were incarcerated simply because of their ancestry, and even though they they were more often than not American citizens. Make sure that I'm wrong. I'm not wrong with that. They were American citizens, right? Um, yes. Uh, their freedom, their constitutional freedoms were taken from them simply because of their ancestry. Exactly. Uh, and the, the nationality, the ancestry, uh, the race, the religion, it all got tied up together. It, w- it was all part of the reason that they were incarcerated. When you uh, look at the government report on Japanese American incarceration called Personal Justice Denied, which might be the most poetic title I've ever heard to a government report. Um, They listed the top three reasons for incarceration, and this was under President Ronald Reagan in 1988 that they finally reported. Um, And they listed war hysteria, prejudice, and a failure of political leadership. Those are the top three reasons. And then they go on to say that greed um, also played a massive role. Oh, that's go ahead, go ahead, Corey. I'm I'm doing my best to process a little bit more here as well. If if you if you had to impart one lesson from all of this um, to to America today, uh, if you could get one people to be cognizant of of this, um, what 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 would you boil down? The, the lesson that history is trying to teach us here? How would you, um, how would you put uh, what, we, what we should learn uh, and, and, and be aware of from this uh, chapter of history? Wow. Um, you know, I, when I lead tours or when I talk to people, 
uh, in the exhibit. And if I hear them discussing, um, you know, Mexican immigration, or I hear them discussing um, Islam or Muslims, or if they're discussing modern topics that are so tied to this, uh, I feel that I've done my job right. That if they can take what happened in the 1940s and apply it to the lessons today, I think I've I've done what I was supposed to, and I think that the exhibit has done as it was supposed to. Um, there have been so many lessons uh, that I think we should have learned that we didn't talk about uh, enough to really learn these issues. And so if we can take what happened then and apply it to what we're seeing now, that's what I I hope to see people doing. America is entering a time of change right now. Uh, We're going to be um, uh, inaugurating a new president in January, uh, and that's going to come along with a new new administration. just for everybody's memory, um, I'm going to I'm going to quote uh, the president-elect here. He said, "Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States until our country's representatives can figure out what the hell is going on." Um, to Time Magazine in December of 2015, I believe it was, he said, "I would have had to have been there at the time to tell you to give you a proper answer uh, when asked if he would have been for." Uh, Japanese incarceration. Um, He said, I certainly hate the concept of it, but I would have had to have been there at the time to give you a proper answer. A former spokesman for a major super PAC backing Donald Trump said that the mass internment of Japanese Americans during World War II was a precedent for the president-elect's plans to create a registry for immigrants from Muslim countries. During an appearance on Megyn Kelly's Fox News show, Carl Higby said a registry proposal being discussed by Trump's immigration advisors would be legal and would hold constitutional muster. We've done it with Iran back a while ago. We did it during World War II with the Japanese, said Higby, a former Navy SEAL and until November 9th, the spokesman for the pro-Trump Great America PAC. Uh, Kelly seemed taken aback by the idea and said, come on, you're not proposing we go back to the days of internment camps, I hope. I'm not proposing that at all, Higby told her, but I'm just saying there is a precedent for it. Are our former incarcerees concerned about this? Are the people who actually lived through this, um, do they see a parallel between this period of time during World War II and, and, the, and the present era? Or is this just um, being blown out of proportion and, and people today um, sort of Imagining a parallel, uh, hearing the, these words being used along with uh, along with the word uh, precedent, uh, and and blowing that and blowing that out of proportion. Is there is there an actual concern that this kind of thing could happen again? Absolutely. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to people who are incarcerated or their their children and grandchildren, and I work with a lot of people. Um, whose families were incarcerated at Heart Mountain. And I do hear them talk about issues today um, really starting to look like pre-incarceration. Um, when we discuss this issue, I think we start with the executive order. And we start with a specific executive order, which was 9066. But leading up to that, there were many executive orders and there were uh, all sorts of conferences and discussions and committees and all sorts of advisors who were really recommending to the president um, these extreme reasons for doing this. And we can, we can look back and I think I hear the argument a lot that it was for national security, that it was necessary. But we knew at the time, and we know from looking at the personal letters of these individuals, that that was not the case. That they did this because of prejudice. That they did this because of using that war hysteria. Um, Even J. Edgar Hoover stood against this. When 
we listen to the rhetoric today, we can listen to the rhetoric of the 40s. Uh, Shirley Ann Higuchi, who is our uh, the head of our board for the Hartmount Wyoming Foundation, wrote an uh, op-ed for USA Today, um, and she said that racism, under whatever justification ex its supporters can find, is still racism. It goes against what makes us all Americans. There's no racial or religious test for being an American. We should not start one now. That is, uh, that, that, that's some powerful stuff right there. Um, do you think that, and, and, and having seen this, and, and I, I suppose one thing that I meant to ask you, do you know about, because this actually leads into something else, about how many visitors your center gets, um, not just per day, but, but per year? Yeah, uh, we we average about, well, it increases. We've only been here about five years. This is our fifth anniversary for our museum. Uh, and this year we had about 15,000 visitors. Um, and that is, considering that. And that oh, yeah, please, uh, go ahead. I, I think you're actually going to, to make make the point there. Oh, considering that we're 14 miles from the nearest town and in um, northern Wyoming, I think people have to really make the effort to come out here. Uh, during the summer, we have tourists who usually are going to see Yellowstone National Park and they loop us into that. Uh, during the winter, we primarily have school groups from Wyoming, Montana, Utah, Colorado, Idaho, um, we're actually getting ready to have a volunteer group who's coming from Nebraska, from the University of Nebraska, who's going to be out here doing volunteer work with us. So having that opportunity not just to talk to the general public and to watch this information be disseminated from parents to children, but also to directly speak to those school groups to make sure that unlike us, this is included in their curriculum. I think that's an extraordinary opportunity. And 15,000, um, you know, I live in a town of 8,000. <laughs> so <laughs> for me, that's a pretty good number. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a bit there. And, and, and I was, um, I noticed in, in, in the comments, I think uh, Justin, who I think he said he lived in Kentucky and grew up there and, I was in school there in public school, and uh, he said that this is something that he had never even heard about. And I can tell you that I think that's the case for a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of Americans. It's to me almost the whitewashing that, and because you're uh, living where, where you do up there in, in, in northern Wyoming, and, and me living, of course, I live in Nebraska as well. Uh, the whitewashing that people get for um, Buffalo Bill Cody, and which, by the way, Cody, Cody, Wyoming makes sense. Um, and for, you know, uh, George Custer and for what, because we hear about the trail of tears, you know, I think, but we don't actually appreciate our, uh, history with what we, you know, did to the American Indians either. And I, I think that people having, because this is the information age, if you will, and I, I think that um, uh, more and more people finding out about your center will also lead to more and more people understanding, uh, first off, that the United States is, is not always the shining beacon of freedom that we would like to be uh, or like to see ourselves as, uh, but... Uh, but also that we that we can learn from this. I also noticed where somebody mentioned, and uh, that they are, and I think this was uh, the Zifara. I think was was speaking, and I have to scroll back up a little bit through the through the chat here, um, where she said that there in Texas there are three uh, called refugee camps for unaccompanied children, and uh, she said. That and the one thing I don't like about the chat room is that whenever somebody puts a new 
word in there. It automatically goes back to the bottom. Uh, it says people here want to keep them incarcerated like the Japanese Americans. They are children. Big, strong American citizens are afraid of children. And I think that uh, this is not much different than that. Uh, what would be your uh, having having you know working there and everything and, and and probably volunteering quite a bit as well? What would be your response mm-hmm. to something like something like that, where it's like these are children? Um. If we look at Japanese American incarceration, about 50% of them were under the age of 18. So we're looking at 60 of 120,000 um, were minors. And we still put them in these prison camps. And I think there's a direct line through history leading to where we are today. And these camps in Texas, or, or I won't call them camps. I don't know exactly what they are. I guess refugee camps. When we were building our railroads, we brought over boatloads of Chinese to build the railroads. And after the railroad was done, uh, they were on the West Coast, and they settled into low-wage jobs there. And everyone got really upset on the West Coast and there was this refrain that you would hear. They took our jobs. We don't want them here. Send them back. They took our jobs. Let good Americans get those jobs. And so we basically loaded them up back into boats and sent them to China, whether they wanted to go or not. And then these jobs lay empty on the West Coast. And Teddy Roosevelt was president around this time, and he had kind of an affinity, unlike his distant cousin, for the Japanese, and he called them honorary Aryans. And he went to the emperor of Japan, and they had this kind of a gentleman's agreement, if you will. And they said, or TR said to him, uh, you know, why don't you send us, send us some people to fill these jobs that nobody's doing on the West Coast. He said, okay, send them to you, but you can't send them back. I saw what you did with China. And so we get all these men who are Japanese, and they start filling these jobs on the West Coast. And they send home for brides, and these brides come over, and they have little Japanese-American babies. And pretty soon, Japanese-Americans own 5% of the land in California. And on that 5% of the land, they're producing 50% of the exports that are food from California in the 40s. On 5% of the land, 50% of the exports. It's extraordinarily productive. And so you see people who are saying, they took our jobs. They're they're taking these low-wage jobs in the laundries and at the restaurants, and they're buying up land. And we locked them up in World War II. We put them in these camps, and Pearl Harbor was the catalyst uh, for the general population to support the Japanese-American removal from the West Coast. And then we have all these jobs that are laying empty up and down the coast in the 40s, and we have a massive war effort. And so all the young men who might have been doing these jobs are off fighting. And so I'm guessing you guys might know what country we approached (laughs) to send us some workers. Oh, yes. The the, the tenuous relationship that the United States has had with Mexico in the past 70 years is, oh, we are, we have not been good to Mexico, (laughs) to say the least. (laughs) Mm. Um, See, um, this is to me, one of the uh, uh, one of the the moments and of course we could also we could spend even more time speaking about how the United States had an opportunity also on the east coast to accept Jewish refugees 
and we chose not to. Mm-hmm. Um, this, to me, and I know to, to, to both of you and a lot of other people, this needs to be known for a couple of different reasons. And more than anything else to me, it's because, as it, as it was mentioned, if we – and it, it, the, the thing with Mexico is quite more difficult, or more complicated, yes, but still, it, it, there's, there's a little bit there. We'll get into it at some point, I'm certain. Um, uh, history, if we don't pay attention to it, if we don't remember it, it has shown itself over and over again that we will absolutely repeat it. And I would rather not. I don't want you know, my country to, to do that again. To continue to do it, actually. We're, we're, right on, we're on the precipice. In my, that, in my opinion... But I think that, that people need to, to know about that. How can they – how can people f- find out about um, what your organization, organization does? How can, they, um, how can they come and visit you? Is there any way that if people wanted to, they could, they could donate uh, to help anything or to – because I know you said you're nonprofit. Give, it, give us uh, some details in case people are interested and also where else they might be able to go um, and, and, and discover some more of this or, or the other places they might be able to visit. Uh, so our website is heartmountain.org, um, all spelled out, H-E-A-R-T, Mountain. Um, there are lots of other sites, the other camps, um, Manzanar, Tule Lake, um, Minidoka, Amachi, they all have their own organizations to help preserve this history and to explore it. Uh, the JACL, or the Japanese American Citizen League, um, and then Japanese American National Museum. There are lots of different places you can go. I'm partial to my organization. Uh, we do a lot of work out here. Um, we are open four days a week, Wednesday through Saturday during the winter, or seven days a week uh, during the summer. If you're making a trip out here, please stop by. Um, we could definitely use your donations. You can explore the different projects that we're working on. Uh, to help preserve the site, to tell these stories on our website. Uh, You can call. We have a research center where we host uh, people who are coming to do research on this. Um, I think just as a a last quick note um, from us, you can also um, listen to George Takei or Norma Mineta or any of the people who are out there on television, on radio, in the newspapers, who are advocating. It might not be something that's right in your face um, or is, you know, top of your list on social media, but it's out there and you can listen to people who are incarcerated tell their stories and talk about their experience and advocate for others. Very well. well, Thank you very much, uh, uh, Danielle. Uh, And again, uh, Danielle Constein, she oversees operations at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center there between Cody and Powell, Wyoming. And again, if you would like more information on that, uh, you can go to www.heartmountain, all spelled out H E R T M O U N T A I N dot org. Uh, wonderful place. I look forward to visiting and, and uh, certainly uh, learning even more as well. Danielle, I uh, want to thank you very much for taking the time out of your evening. Um, hopefully you if you come on here, hopefully you stayed warm. I know it's <laughs> quite chilly in, in northern Wyoming right now. I know it's, it's, it's basically below zero here in, in Nebraska, so um, I can't imagine how much cooler it is or colder it is uh, up, up your way. Um, but thank you very much for, for coming on. You're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of thank yous in uh, the chat and on Periscope as well. Um, and, and do you have a, a Twitter or do you have uh, any other, uh, ways that people can reach out to you personally, if they want to, uh, to just talk to you about it? If I, yeah, you can approach, uh, the Heart Mountain, um, 
We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. Uh, we have emails. We have a phone. <laughs> you can get a hold of me <laughs> however, however you'd like if you want to ask questions. Um, my email is Danielle C at heartmountain.org. Uh, and I'd be happy to speak with you guys if you had questions or uh, if you're planning a trip out here. Um, thank you, Nathaniel. Thank you, Corey. I really enjoyed speaking with you today. I it was a sincere pleasure. Uh, we really, we yeah. really want to extend our heartfelt thank you uh, for for joining us uh, for our uh, for our for our fifth episode uh, at Informed Secular Minds. Uh, it's been uh, it's been an honor and an educational experience, and I certainly hope that uh, that our listeners uh, learned something new today. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Um, thank you again, uh, Danielle. Um, the that's it's such such. I'm, I call it great history. Um, it's obviously not great history, Corey, but it's 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 great to know that history and to know that it exists and to know that we in the United States are far from immune from some of the atrocities that we see overseas. Um, and then hopefully we, we find a way to avoid that type of history uh, happening again. 